Hello. In this clip from our Just You webinar, SEO for Lawyers 2023 Highlights and 2024 Forecasts, members of our Justia SEO team will talk about how Google and other major players began adopting and integrating AI into their search results pages and what to expect during 2024. If you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. The, the bigger thing right this year, which didn't go live, but was announced was sort of Google sort of adding the generative AI into the search results. And I know everybody was sort of focused on that. It hasn't gone live yet, uh, but we know it's going to go live. Um, so let me run through this stuff a bit. This will probably be the, the, the main part I sort of wanted to present today. Uh, but let me sort of uh, just sort of go through it. Um, for some of all, we can do a little mini overview here as well, like sort of like Gus, but just for the AI part. Uh, and then I'll run through, you know, Bing a little bit, uh, Google, uh, using AI content and rankings a bit, uh, and how you can use AI to write content, some issues with AI, and a little bit about Google, Microsoft, and to a lesser extent, Amazon Anthropic. All right. First thing, you know, Chat GPT 3.5 came out, you know. It wasn't quite that quietly released. It sort of took over. Everybody liked using it um, mm -hmm. in terms of stuff. And that was 3.5. What uh, was good for is certainly better. Um, and so it came out. You know, you can go sign up for it. You could use it. it it's great. You, you should, well, everyone here should sign up for GPT-4. I'd pay the $20 a month. It's worth it. All right. It's better than 3.5. You should be using it, especially if you're ever going to use it for legal content. Just just sign up for it. Again, I mentioned this before, but it's it's a no brainer. Uh, the one thing, again, I'm gonna point right here that'll take you to the uh, get GPT webinar we did. If you click on that upper corner there, up uh, on in YouTube, but you know AI from for for tech stuff, this is just autocomplete. This is fancy autocomplete. They have lots of data, right? There's the, you know all the the entire web. I mean, they they can. You know, text data is pretty easy to pull in. They, they can process it, but it's just trying to get to the next word. All right. So this is not, don't think that you're talking to someone that's sort of thinking something. It's just, it's autocomplete. It's fancy autocomplete, but it, it's, it's autocomplete. But I just want you to remember that as we look through this part. So again, sign up for GPT-4, but just remember what this is. This is not really someone thinking. All right. And I, we go into much more detail in that previous webinar, which you can, you can watch if you want to get more insights into it. Um, Google came out with Bard. Bard at first was not not the best, but it's been getting better all the time. So it, it, it consistently gets better, but which is nice. Uh, uh, and it's you, you should try that out as well. It, that's free, so you should sign up for it. And then Anthropic has Claude, which is which is good. And then you, if you do your own stuff and you want some open source models um, to, to play with, um, Meta or Facebook has uh, Llama too. Right, which a lot of people have used and actually can get working uh, as well using certain types of testing, which you're not supposed to be doing, but using OpenAI to help test it. You can build it up and get at least to uh, uh, um, GPT 3.5. So, but those those two don't really have much to do with search right now, so we're not going to really talk about much anymore. Um, but let's put a step back. What's really been driving a lot of this has been Microsoft and Bing. So. It's, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, Google's the main search, you know, sort of, sort of the, the, the thousand pound uh, uh, sort of dominator when it comes to search thing. You know, it's built into, uh, you know, I guess Microsoft Edge on Windows. Uh, but other than that, not, not a lot of people using it. But, you know, they, they, got, they do have a search engine out there. It, it exists, right? <laughs> and so Bing has been looking to improve it so they can compete with Google. And then they... It's been hard, right? Their results aren't been quite as good in different things. So they did a big sort of announcement with OpenAI uh, to, to bring uh, uh, basically the chat GPT or GPT functionality into Bing results. And, you know, they, they put $13 billion into this company. So it's, it's $13 billion, but that $13 billion is being spent using Microsoft cloud services uh, to sort of Great, you know, sorry, generate the results and things. I mean, open AI in and of itself doesn't really make money right now. Uh, 
So they, they own 49% of it. They put 13 billion in and it sort of comes back to them in terms of the services, but they do need to provide the services, right? And that does obviously cost money to provide and different things like that. Um, and so Bing came out, you know, they started adding in the uh, 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 open AI uh, GPT in there. And here's an example result. This is what's stationed uh, limitations for theft in California. And right here, this is the GPT uh, section of it, right? Fine. This is the section, and it's right there. And you can interact with it. I can expand it. I can see more. It gives me some sources. This is not bad. All right. So that's where things were going. And then, of course, OpenAI uh, board, which was funded as a nonprofit, sort of to protect people from AI in a way and sort of open things up, fired Sam Altman. Right, who was running it and it turned it into a company, right? It's actually a company controlled by the nonprofit. So they fired him, and that happened on Friday. And then immediately, Microsoft hired him. Uh, the CTO of Microsoft announced that they would hire all the uh, OpenAI programmers. And by the way, Microsoft has access to all the codes and everything else also on their servers, right? They have access to everything. Now, Microsoft could do this themselves right now. They don't technically need to open AI to do it. Uh, but they offered to hire everybody. And then, of course, uh, uh, Sam Baldwin came back on it. So just a, just a couple of things on this. One, open AI for all practical purposes could be thought of as being part of Microsoft. All right, Microsoft is now going to be, again, my observer's seat on the board. They're not technically on the board, but this is not happening again. This happens again, Microsoft will just take over the whole thing. All right. It doesn't mean that they don't want people working hard and, you know, there's people have equity in open AI. It's certainly all those programmers didn't sign up for a nonprofit. Um, so there's people involved with that who obviously would have left and um, this, this uh, change not been made uh, back. Um, but the other thing to note is that you're not going to be able to run a large AI service without being a company because no one's going to give $13 billion to a nonprofit to do AI stuff. Not going to happen. That, that is being driven by uh, economics and sort of looking to you know get control of things. So in a way, open AI needs to be a company in order to do any services. They could always be, you know, otherwise they could certainly be a, um, you know, an academic council or something that, you know, talked about AI and the dangers of society, but that's not what it is. Right now, it's a service-based thing, and it's really, for all practical purposes, part of Microsoft. This won't happen again. Um, so I wouldn't worry about this part. I don't think Microsoft is worried about it, but Microsoft, at this point, if this happens again, they'll just take over everything. They'll pay people up, and you know, it's a nearly a $3 trillion company. They can, they can afford it um, in terms of what they need to do. Uh, but this was not good, but it got resolved quickly. So I wouldn't as far as lawyers go, I'd keep using uh, GPT. I, I think Bing, you know, will keep going the path. This was very short blip, but it did show what can happen when you don't really necessarily have control of the board when you're Microsoft. So I'll leave it out. All right. So Bing came out, everybody talked about it, and uh, there was sort of panic initially at Microsoft. I would say the panic has, has dissipated a bit. Um, but initially, I think there was a lot of concern that Bing might start taking a large part of search uh, just because it had this uh, AI stuff. Because ChatGPT was taking off, right? Everybody was using it. You know, they were writing poems and lyrics, and some people were writing the law firm uh, website pages. Um, so Google started working on their own stuff. And the interesting part about this is that the core of everything that OpenAI does is actually been driven by research from Google. It's not like, Google doesn't know all this. Google's got the top AI folks in the world. The stuff that OpenAI based their things off came from published Google work, which maybe you know, they maybe they probably think a little bit should they have published it because they started creating a competitor. Uh, but Google has the talent. I mean, the, the skill. It, it, and they brought all their AI guys together. This is this became a huge focus. It continues to be a huge focus, not just for search, but for everything. Right. Same thing for Microsoft. It's important for Bing. But it's really important for Microsoft Office, right? You know, Google's adding it into, uh, you know, Google Workspace. So Google went into this and it's really sort of driven stuff. From the SEO perspective, uh, you know, they're doing this, you know, search with generative AI integration. And right now that's in Google Lens. So you can try this out right now. If you want to find it, type Google 
space GSE and Google. All right. And it'll, it'll pull up and then you can log in and get an account. If for some reason you're, you're running things, your Google apps through uh, like your, uh, uh, your business or something, and they shut off the access to labs like we do, like we don't have access to labs uh, directly. Uh, then you'll need to make a separate personal account. Just use a Gmail account, make that and go in that way that you can use it personally. So just, just something to note. Sometimes if you're in a larger firm and they're trying to protect certain things, they don't necessarily want Google seeing everything. Uh, they, they might lock, lock out uh, access to all the, the, all the labs, all the additions that Google sometimes provides. But you can still see it. So you might just make a Gmail account. So if you, if you go there, you, you click in. The one you want to do right here is the AI and search. Okay? It's right there. All right, and this is sort of came from what, what Gus was showing earlier. Let's go take a look and see how it looks. All right, so here's a normal page. All right, this is just a page for what's the statute of limitations for medical malpractice in Maryland. This is what Google would show uh, without the generative uh, search. And this is what it looks like with the generative search, uh, uh, you know, the AI stuff sort of integrated into it. And it's basically two parts. It's this part here up at the top, kind of like a additional snippet like Gus mentioned. Now, wh whether they'll keep this in the snippet once they release it, I don't know. You know, it seems like they're just doubling it up right now. I imagine they keep one, not both. But it's it's right there above. And there's also a little bit here. I mean, the people also ask that it actually gets you into the AI component, right? You can sort of dig in there. And then once you're in there, you can start having conversations. So if we take a look at this part here, we click on the show more, it sort of expands out, right? Give some of the sources, some things you can check out. Give some other uh, things might, you know, if you want to start getting involved with a question or something like that, give some additional things you can take a look at, you know. Is there a cap, you know, different que related questions, or you could just start asking your own questions and then you're involved with like a conversation, just like with Bard or just like with chat GPT right now, he's just going back and forth. Well, this is sort of the integration in here. And again, you can, it's good, right? So if someone's looking for an answer, they might get involved with something where they start going back and forth with us. All right, let's look at a couple other examples. Oh, and there's a, sorry, highlight the whole thing there. All right. Here's another one. This one's for best Mexican restaurants in Mountain View. Of course, the answer is just the Del Mar 2, but they don't have that here. But it's, I guess it's fine. Um, this is it. This is where the generative AI is this time. Okay. Uh, it's just a strip with regenerate. Doesn't really stick out too much. You know what I mean? Uh, and this just shows, though, that when Google wants to, they can minimize this, right? They don't need to expand it every time with what looks like a snippet. And this something like, uh, you know, Mexican restaurants, this might be a thing where they make a lot of advertising dollars on, right? There's no ads showing up right now, but they could, right? This is this could be something which really sort of drives ads. And if that's the case, Google might minimize it a little bit. Here's another one, Los Angeles criminal lawyer. Not even a question, just like a search term. And here it is again, it's minimized. There's a little bit down here at the bottom uh, as well. Uh, but again, it, the lawyers and restaurants, those are big money makers for Google, right? They make well over a hundred million bucks a year. I think probably much more uh, just on lawyers with the local services ads, right? And the other ads. Um, so they might not expand this out. They might not, they might really want you clicking on ads, maybe also on, on the organic search results. I mean, we're there with Michael Kraut right there, but I think they really want you to click on the ads and they might not want to take away from the ads by having too much of a AI experience there, something that they make money off. All right. Here's another one. Here's uh flights from San Francisco to uh, Chicago. So here. And this time they don't even show it. All right. This is, you know, generative AI experience, Google labs, right? We're here. And they don't even show it this time. They don't give you the option to see it. They don't give you options. Hey, would you like to maybe fly to Midway? No, none of that here. There's no conversation at all going on. And here's another one. What car insurance should I get? This one's actually showing ads on the generative search experience, which is interesting. Uh, this is one of the biggest ones so they make money off is, you know, selling insurance. This is a big time, you know, marketing. I mean, watch his football games and those that watch all the different insurance companies, right? I mean, so this this is something, again, they're not bringing in the general search experience at all, but they are showing the ads. So, you know, the, the, the main thing I, I wanted to point out here, whether it's this where they have sort of like a snippet or it's this where they have like a little minimization of something that you might get involved with, or this one, they have nothing. Google controls that, all right? 
Google is not going to release this and suddenly lose 10, 20% of the revenue because people get involved with AI jets. Okay. It's not going to happen. They will be on top of that part. And they don't need to run it for everything. Google does not make most of their money. Yeah, it doesn't make their money off every chat. They make their, their money off particular types of, uh, I mean, every search, off particular searches, lawyers, insurance, right? iPhones, different things that people buy, products and services to a large extent. They don't make as much money off research questions, like what's the statute of limitations? Doesn't mean you might want to have the answer to him, someone come to your site and then hire you. This is probably a good indication that they might be concerned about something, either as a plaintiff or a defendant, depending on what the, uh, the situation is. Uh, but Google's not necessarily selling that. It's really not selling that as much as they might sell, I don't know, you know, Birmingham personal injury lawyer in terms of search terms. Um, so there, there's a, a, a power that Google has here that they can sort of play with these levers to make sure they're not losing the revenue. But I guarantee you the revenue is not going to go down because they introduced this. This should be probably seen more as a superpowered snippet. And then the question for you is how do you become involved with that snippet? And what can you sort of do to uh, be involved there? But I'll, I'll walk through a little bit of that in, in just a moment. Um, so anyway, so it's not, they're not, I, I don't think it'll be hugely different for folks in terms of stuff, but yeah, we do want to see what happens this next year. This will be released this year in, or in 2024. Um, and it might have some, you know, some changes, you know, for certain searches, certain click through rates and things like that. Um, but hopefully from a Google standpoint, it doesn't impact their ads, right? So that's the, the one thing I think they're very concerned about. Again, the, the last thing is not quite as concerned as they were because uh, Bing did not take off the way that it could have. So they've been a little bit more, they got more time. They're not pushing it quite as fast as they might have had to had Bing started, you know, taking larger market share. Okay. So that's Google. They can think of it as like a fancy snippet. They're going to take their time for certain stuff for services, probably not have that much of an impact because, you know, organic and ads that you've been running for sort of tongue in. Long tail might have a little bit of an impact, right? If people want to chat with something rather than just click on a link, but we'll have to sort of see how that, how that plays out a little bit. Um, so AI content rankings, let's go through here. So this is the you know, summer 2022. It looked like Google was like, whoops, it's my dog here. Uh, Google was a guest AI content uh, in terms of what was sort of going on uh, and that they wait sort of punish it. Uh, and they had this, uh, one second. Okay, brings my dog outside. Sorry about that. Um, they had this uh, helpful content update, and what they had mentioned that helpful content update was that they wanted helpful content made by people for people. And what people sort of jumped on here was the by people. Okay, that was the thing that sort of driven it. Other than that, it was the the base stuff, the basic stuff. They wanted, you know, they don't want unoriginal, low quality content. They want high quality original content, right? In terms of stuff. Okay, so that was then. Then. Chat GPT came out, uh, you know, after the, the helpful content update, people started using that, uh, and, uh, Google started announcing their own stuff and, uh, now they have new guidance on it. And right now, I mean, Google does allow you to use it. They're, they're totally fine, right? It's just a tool. It's like a spell checker, right? In a way, it's just one more thing. And people have used it and it's been fun, right? They, they'll search engine last stuff some tests. It's, it's been ranking fine. Now, just because it's AI doesn't really matter. What does matter is this, is the, it's a year, one year, a life top. So there are issues with AI, right? And, and the issues uh, are is AI makes mistakes every once in a while. So while for ranking, it's fine. If you use AI for all your content and you don't check it, and you don't go through or you don't add some, you know, some real additional analysis, which might not get picked up by the AI. Most of the times, the, the really core legal analysis, uh, both GPT and BARD sometimes make up. I mean, I've seen it make up well, I've seen both both of these make up full cases, not just citations, actually give you the full case and everything's made up except for the judge, right? The judge is the real judge and it makes up the citation and it gives you the full case result. It's really disturbing in many ways. So you can't really trust it for it. So I would certainly use it and I'll talk about that in just a few moments here, but and you're not going to get punished for having AI, but if you just aren't using AI, and you don't check it, 
you're at risk. And I will say right now, a lot of law firms right now have started using AI and they're not checking it. And it's really, and you can tell, it's not that hard to figure out. So they're not adding anything. And, you know, for simple stuff, it might be okay. But for other stuff, it's really bad and it's wrong. And if you just use an AI and you don't go through and do the additional checks, it's not going to be good. The other thing about it is that it, it tends to do sort of lowest common denominator type stuff. The stuff that, you know, can autocomplete off lots of repetitive stuff. So basic stuff about a car accident, right? It, as you get into more details, statute of limitations, sort of some of the exceptions, it does not do a good job. In addition, GPT in particular doesn't seem to be as good as the most more recent stuff. It's trying to pull stuff in from Bing, but it doesn't have a sense really as much when it's auto-completing and what's better, higher quality content. Bard's actually much better at that. So Bard actually does a better job of knowing what's more recent. So if you've been using both recently, you'll see Bard's better when getting to details. Um, but neither are perfect. So you absolutely need to go through and check it. And if you think you're going to use this and suddenly hit a couple buttons or write a thousand pages, you're not going to rank it all. Um, and people have tried it and they're done. And they're just the whole site, especially if something like law, because it actually went us. All right. So how would you use it? How would you use AI to the right content? Let's say you're actually, okay, you're actually going to go through and you are going to check it. You are going to take it serious, but use it as a tool. What are different things you could do? Well, one thing is you just go to and you say, write me a page, right? So here, I said, write me a page. I'm a criminal lawyer in Fresno. I want one about shoplifting. Uh, optimize it, you know, for Fresno criminal lawyers serving shoplift the shoplifting uh, uh, those accused of shoplifting and make it 600 words. All right, and it went through and it wrote me this, okay? First of all, it's not 600 words. It's like 400 words. <laughs> it's not 600. Uh, that's one thing to note. Uh, but the other thing, it's it's okay, right? It looks well. It, it, it looks pretty good. Um, got some good information on it. No, no real details here, though. I don't really see anything um, that's really sort of detail-oriented. This is very uh, generic, this page from, from GPT. I mean, I don't really, I don't get a full sense, like, what leads to shoplifting? What's the the amount that, you know, causes something to be, you know, petty versus like grand larceny type of stuff? Just very generic. But that that's GPT. They tend to do that. It tends to be more generic. All right. With the Bard, then the same thing. From a lawyer, this is the same question. For us now, shoplifting. Make it six hundred words. All right. They go through and they do it. And this is better. They also tell me it's 592 words, although technically the, the text of the article's only like 524. But if you go through here, it's giving me some details, right? It's telling me about petty theft, you know, misdemeanor, grand theft. It's giving me some details. I have no idea if these details are correct or not. You know, 50 to 1,000, you know, the different stuff. And, you know, in California, we have a lot of theft these days uh, because of different things. But it gives me some details up here, but more details tend to come from Bard. It's probably okay, but I would, if I'm a criminal lawyer, I'll know this for sure because that's my practice. I'll go through and I'll check it. But I, I, I'm not, I, mean, I worked in the public defender's office for a summer, but I don't really know the current state of shoplifting law, right? Um, but you do need to go read through it and, and then you can sort of go through and, and see how, you know, what, what makes it good, what doesn't make it good. You can then go through and you can ask it to update different sections. You can go back and forth and use it to make it better, right? So that's one item. So you could just go there directly, just ask it. Uh, you could also, if you don't want to just use the chat GPT or a BARD, you know, both uh, Microsoft has a, a, a way in, like a little, you can use the APIs if you want to use some programming, but if you don't, they have different sandboxes. You can actually log in and you can use it on Microsoft and then they have one on Google where you can actually fine tune a lot of the variables. You can remove some of the, uh, you know, sort of variants if you want, if you think about it like that. Like, like variants is good sometimes, make it more readable. Experience is bad on things like, I don't know, citations, right? You don't want a random citation. That's no good. So you can actually play with these variables on both um, Microsoft and Google. When, and Microsoft, again, is just using the open AI GPT. And uh, Google has uh, uh, access to their uh, Vertex, which is basically the, the, the stuff that powers uh, a BART. And we'll be soon coming with uh, Gemini. For us, you know, we have some stuff that we put up for our elevated clients where they can quickly produce content for free. We spent a lot of time on our prompts and we broke out our prompts in different ways. So we actually go through, we write different things, which you might think about doing yourselves if you're doing it individually. Uh, you already press a button, you get it, but you still need to read through it, right? 
And we put these warnings right in yellow uh, with red text on yellow right here on every page. Uh, and this is, you know, let's say something here. Uh, this is to make sure that people go through and they actually check it, make sure it's correct and good. You can't just put it up. Even if it's coming by way of adjusting, we're not, we're running this still through the AI. Our prompts are pretty good. We know different ways to do the prompts and tend to get better answers, but that's not the same as being sure it's correct. There's still a randomness in this and we're not just using get GPT. We have different you know parameters and settings for things. Um, that said, I will tell you right now, we have clients, our clients, just as clients that we talk to who will take this Word document, like we will not put this into their WordPress installation, right? We don't put it in automatically because we know if we put it in automatically, they won't do anything. We just let it go. We give them a Word document and say, go through it, edit it. And I swear to God, they take this, they copy it, including all the disclaimers at the top and on every paragraph. And that's our clients who know better, who get, who get worried. About, I mean, how many times have they been worried about? Um, I've seen people do it after three warnings. So I don't, that, that's just, I don't know if that's, that probably says something about the, the lawyer doing it. But if you're watching, hey, don't do that anymore. You know, you're a case sample. I didn't put your name out there, but you know I'm thinking it. Uh, but this is, a, this is a problem with AI in law, especially for lawyers. I, and again, AI is like, for the most part, it's like a B minus student, right? It'll pass, but it's a B minus. And what Google wants with the YMYL is they want an A student. So... You know, we do this, we got lots of little things going into these prompts for the different sections. That, that That's a lot of work on it. Um, but it's something where it's still not an A. You still need to go through and really fix it if you want to make it. it it's easier to edit, to add, than to write it from scratch, but you still need to work on it some. The other thing that you can always use uh, AI for, which is always a good idea, is take your current stuff and put it through there and ask, and ask it to approve it. So I took the the one I wrote for Bard, with the one I like better between the GPT and the Bard for that uh, shout out one Fresno. And I clipped and copied it. I stuck it here into uh, uh, GPT and I said, uh, improve this. So I asked GPT to improve through my Bard essay. And they went through it. Yeah, they made it, they made it better. It's actually better. The GPT one's uh, better than the Bard one. By itself, it wasn't better. But with, with the improvement, it was, I thought I liked it better. So... You can also use it to improve your current stuff, which is fun, right? But double check it. It might improve it and actually make it wrong, which you don't want to have happen. The main thing here, again, and I, there's so many times I have the slide up. Well, that's not the last time. I'm going to have one more time coming up. Um, the, the main thing here is that, Google, that for Google, law is a, your money, your life topic. And they really, really care about having high quality content. So you need to take the time to really make it good right? Don't mess around. Really, you know, really, really work on it in, in terms of doing this stuff. Add some real legalese there. Make your stuff different than everybody else. Add some court cases and stuff. None of these AI guys are good at getting citations and stuff, right? We've all seen that in the, in, you know, the different stuff in the past. You know, add some real legal content in there and you, you know, it's a great way to get you started. And it's also a great way just to check your current site and your current content. Um, but again, it's, you know, anyone can pass the bar exam. You pass the bar exam, not anyone, but you should be able to pass the bar exam pretty easy. That's stuff you learned three years ago in a time, you know, a short time test. And you don't even have to get it 100%. In the real world, and on Google, if you get 60%, you're going to be disbarred, okay? And you're not going to rank. So don't assume that, oh, yeah, it beat out, it did well in the time pressure thing. This is a time pressure. This needs to be done right. The good news is your law firm, for the most part, it needs to be done once, and they need to update it when the laws change, which with the current Congress, it doesn't happen too often, so you're probably okay for a bit. Um, but anyways, your money or your life, that's the main thing you need to know about legal content. All right, I'm going to go a little bit over time here, uh, but this stuff, you know, it, the, we're recording all this, so if something comes up, you can go. This is not as important as the stuff that we covered. That was the main stuff I wanted to cover. This is some just some additional issues and a little bit about uh, Google and the future of Google compared to Microsoft and a little bit about Google and Apple. All right, quick AI issues. It's not always accurate. So I've used this example in the past. I'll use it again. Is same-sex marriage legal in Mississippi? This is coming from GPT, from ChatGPT. And it says it's not legal in Mississippi, even though the Supreme Court said it is legal. Again, this is autocomplete. It's autocompleting the content that it finds. It's not thinking. 
It even knows the Supreme Court said it's legal throughout the United States, and it still says it's not legal in Mississippi. And by the way, if you go read the Mississippi Code, the Mississippi Code says it's not legal in Mississippi because codes aren't laws. Codes are legislative intent documents. They're not laws. You know, they, especially in some states, they're definitely not laws. They think all different types of things. Um, so regardless of that, had you just taken this and put it up, you would be wrong, and then you would not be ranking well in Google because you were wrong. Other times, it gets it right. But here it's the thing. It's random. Right? You can control this randomness a little bit if you use the Microsoft interface uh, for it. Uh, I think OpenAI has their own interface, so I think it's limited to uh, uh, 3.5 or 3.5 Turbo. Uh, but you want to use GPT-4. Uh, Microsoft has an interface uh, uh, that you could use. But again, the big, big thing here is this is random. It's not thinking. It is auto-completing. And there's a lot of different content that was in that common crawl that said uh, same-sex marriage was not legal in Mississippi, right? That was updated to 2021, but a lot of that stuff was really old, right? Just because that's the latest content it has. A lot of that content was from the you know, 2000. So you got you to take it into account. Here's another one, okay? All right, so... I asked, you know, who was who was older when they were when they were uh, elected president, Grover Cleveland or George W. Bush? And it comes through and it tells me, okay, well, Grover Cleveland was forty seven when he was first elected. That's right here. George W. Bush was fifty four. But ahead, it tells me that Grover Cleveland was older when he was first elected, even though it knows two seconds later that Grover Cleveland was forty seven and George W. Bush was fifty four. It doesn't do math. It doesn't do logic. This is auto completing. And what's probably going on here is it looked at their absolute birth dates and it said Grover Cleveland's older than George W. Bush. That's probably what happened. And I asked it after it did this first part where it said, you know, Grover Cleveland was 47 when elected and George W. Bush was 54 and then asked it. It could use that previous, uh, you know, information in the context and would probably autocomplete and say, oh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, 54 is older than 47. So, but anyways. This, this is just an example of how it doesn't know math. It's, it's, it's basically autocomplete and it makes mistakes. If it makes mistakes with the law and you're writing a legal page, that's a problem for you. And that's a problem for Google in terms of ranking you. So you really need to check this. All that stuff about the shoplifting stuff, I don't know if that was true. I would need to double check that. Hopefully it was in my area of law. I would know that off the cuff. But otherwise, I really need to go to the statutes and take a look. You got to double check it. The more esoteric it is, the more you need to check it. If it's citing a court case or trying to pull up stuff from an individual case, then you really need to check it, man. Because it tends to, it gets court cases wrong all the time. Again, this is trying to autocomplete off lots of random information. So it's not you got to double check it. All right. I want to mention two things about accuracy before I go on here. There, there are two ways that you could actually help increase your accuracy. Uh, and one way is by working on your prompts. And you can go look. Uh, there's different YouTube videos, different uh, blog posts about how to you know, take your prompts and really ask it more detailed questions and how it gets the information, even if you're not going to use it. And explain to me your sources and how you got there, right? Do different things like that, which then forces it in a way to try to autocomplete. And answering that part actually ends up sort of pulling in better information. So that's one way that things work. You work on the prompt, and the prompt itself helps you get a better info. The second thing is controlling the information that it's looking at. The one way is actually you give it the, the whole context, the whole page of content you have already. You say, rewrite this, make it better, right? It uses that and improves it, but that's the main thing it's working on, right? You can do that for things like that. You can use it for things like, you know, if you're trying to summarize a case or something like that. It's pretty good at that. Um, the other thing is you have certain data sets that you focus on certain data sets. So I want to look at this data set. Here's my core data set. I did all the training data on it, and I want to pull results out of it. That's what like Thompson and uh, Lexus are doing in terms of their AI for helping you write briefs and things like that. They're training on data sets. And you might have one data set for contracts. You might have one data set for business briefs. You might have one data set for criminal briefs, right? Different, different data sets for different things. But that's a different, that's a bigger play. Most of you guys are just using generic chat GPT or maybe using the, you know, sort of different sandboxes going in and playing with the variables slightly, but maybe. Uh, but if you are doing that, then you maybe try to figure out, just add some additional text to your, your prompts or your, your questions that you're asking 
that says, and explain to me how you got there and give me the steps. And then sort of take the parts that you want. It'll help you get better answers. Uh, that said, you still need to check it. You could still be wrong. All right. Copyright and authorship. Some of this stuff from your standpoint, uh, from lawyer law firm standpoint, has been solved a little bit, but let me sort of run through it. All right. We saw a lot of these lawsuits happening, right? We saw lawsuits on images where they, these guys are making images based on Getty images they had downloaded and, and we just sort of bring the, the Getty sort of logo into the images that they would create using AI. Uh, and we saw this lawsuit happening with uh, Microsoft uh, and GitHub and uh, OpenAI, you know, the stuff we're using the, uh, uh, the co-pilot stuff to help you write code faster, right? It was basically using other people's code to help produce autocompletes for code. And so lawsuits were going on. All right, so what's happened here is Microsoft has sort of jumped in and said, hey, we're going to, if there's a, someone sues you, we'll step, we'll step in and, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll cover you. We'll, we'll cover your, we'll, we'll, we'll litigate it on your behalf. We'll, we'll cover the damages, right? Uh, co pilot stuff. For, for stuff that you're using their systems for, okay? Google, same stuff. All right, hey, we'll, 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 we're, we're in there with you. We want to release this stuff. We realize there's copyright issues if something pops up. And they realize all of a sudden they're suing little mom and pop stores because they used AI and somehow created something that was very similar to someone else. Yeah, you know, they'll, they'll step in and help out. All right. So that, that part's good. And those are the big two players for stuff you guys be doing. That said, there are a couple of things on content. One thing, if you provide content to them, they might use it for their services. This is open AI, so it's true with, uh, with, with, uh, their own, with most of the other AI providers. Stuff you provide, they might use for their services. They might not necessarily use in different ways. The other stuff is this. This is like open AI's terms, but this is let me just sort of covering the basic stuff. Um, there's different copyright issues and you know, there's worldwide issues and things like that. Um that's fine. And they'll, you know, step in, sort of help you out when, when you sing some of this stuff uh, in terms of what you're using, and they're doing some licensing deals. The bigger issue here though, it's not it's from both a copyright issue and I think from an ethical issue for most states for lawyers. Is when people take other law firms' content, run it through the open AI or run it through BART and say, rewrite this page. So they go out, they find a page that's ranking well, they say, this is great, I want you to rewrite it. That part, you have to, uh, if, if you get sued or they get, or if open AI gets sued, you're going to indemnify them. So if you do that, you're copying someone else's using AI, and for some reason that person decides to sue open AI, you're on the hook. You can't take copyrighted content and run it through this stuff and Expect that to be okay. The stuff you put in has to be your own. So don't think that you could come in here and say, I'm going to go grab this guy's website and run through every page. I'll run it through Bard, and there we go. Uh, you, I mean, I'm not saying you're going to get caught, but if you do get caught, you can get sued. Also, probably going to have some ethical issues, ripping off other people's stuff and using it. That said, I can think of some particular examples where I've seen that. And I know that because of the, just the layout and the structure and the content being so exact to the other ones, even though the, the text has been changed. So I know some folks have, for our clients, have taken our client stuff and our client will have to work through that with the person who took it. Um, but if something happens, you're not, you're not, you're not supposed to be doing that, right? And my deal, again, my deal ethical issue as well. But that, that is happening right now. So don't do that, right? Write your own, start off, write your own, get your own stuff going, improve your own. Not that hard. All right, plagiarism, same thing as before. You know, sometimes it'll turn out similar results. It happens more if you're taking someone else's stuff. Um, you can run it through CopyScape, but again, this this tends to pass CopyScape stuff. But this really hasn't been an issue. You're not really getting through CopyScape on this part. It knows how to change words. Uh, this is something more that you, you look at the structure, you can see someone's copying someone else's site. And I got, I'm telling you one thing, those guys have a water file of every single thing you send over. So that's all discoverable. Don't think you'll get away from that part. They'll be, they can, they, they send a discovery request. They'll start finding out your, they'll, they'll see everything you sent over if you're ripping off someone else. That's very doable. Um, so they'll do it. The plagiarism stuff doesn't really, it's hard to, it's hard to check. It doesn't really do much. It's more of looking at the, the groups of content, right? Than any particular page at this point. I mean, you see one car accident page, you've seen a thousand. So they're not overly different as they are. All right. Privacy stuff. Same thing. There's a, uh, you know, chat GPT used to have some issues with privacy, uh, bug leaks, things like that. It's, you know, if you submit stuff over to a certain extent, you know, this is different than the, the, the like legal research. I wouldn't overly be worried about it if I was doing legal research. 
probably still wouldn't be worried about it. I don't think anyone's really going in there doing it, but you got to realize it might get leaked out, including your queries that you did, right? All right. And then in terms of what I think will happen with you know, Google, Microsoft, and I, look, to me, OpenAI is really sort of part of Microsoft. I know it's not really, but in a way, uh, if we sit here, we take a look at search engine uh, market share. This is the overall share. Uh, we can see, okay, well, Google has 88%, Bing has 7 and that's sort of broken down two ways. This is desktop. You can see my Google has 77%, Bing is 15 mainly from, um, to a large extent, because it's built into Windows, right? Windows and Edge, I uh, think it's a false Bing. And then on mobile, uh, Google's doing even better, because Google has Android. They also have the deal with uh, Apple at 95% here, and Bing doesn't even beat out DuckDuckGo, right? Uh, at least on this stack counter uh, site. Um, this is just for the U.S., right? Uh, you know, different countries and stuff have different things, uh, different some localized search engines. Um, the big thing here is though is that the Bing changes hasn't greatly impacted Google in terms of their search traffic, right? It really hasn't really had much impact yet. So I don't think they felt that pressure yet. Yep, they're still going to do it. The bigger thing with AI for Google and to a certain extent for Microsoft is to get into every single one of their other products. But for search, you know, it's an add-on thing, and they, they will add it on. But if it starts cutting their revenue, I think it'll go away from the searches when they have revenue, at the least to the extent that it causes issues or be minimized in some way uh, pretty quickly. And then Gemini is coming out. It's it's out right now. You can use like the beginning parts of it. There, there's a great video, which is, I think, sort of put together. Uh, but it'll be out this spring, and it'll be much, much better. And it should be, you know, it should be able to beat out GPT-4. And eventually, I think, you know, Google will win this game. And I think Google's better at data. I think they're better at, they have more users in terms of using the, get users to use it. Uh, the models, you know, everybody, everybody has access to the models. Uh, uh, but I just think Google has a higher level uh, of focus on it. And I think they're doing it in-house. It, it's, it's a big thing for them. And it ties to everything they do. So I, I see Google winning this both in the search and in AI in general. But that's me. That's how I see it right now. I don't, I see Google um, you winning the whole thing. Uh, they, once they get focused in on it. I think they've been a little hesitant to release stuff, but if that hesitancy comes away, they'll, they'll blow them out of the water. All right. One last thing on stuff. This is a Tim Cook, right? Just like Steve Jobs. All right. Let's go back to this part here. This is the uh, mobile operating system worldwide. And you can see Android is high, and then we have Android, you know, pretty high up, you know, around 70% or so. And then we have... Um, iOS, you know, around 30%. In the U.S., though, it's iOS has a higher share, right? They're over 50%, and uh, uh, Android's around 40%. So that's the U.S. And U.S. has, from a marketing sales part, uh, uh, sort of key. And what's driving a lot of this iOS stuff is the fact that now old iPhones are being used, right? Apple's kept support for the older iPhones, and people buy the old iPhones, so they use the old iPhones. So people just, it's, it's really... It's an interesting way because they didn't really have a cheap product, but the older, their older models have become their cheap product and they've actually done pretty good in terms of getting those out. Okay, so that's great, Tim. What, 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 why the hell do I care about um, Apple versus, you know, Android in terms of search? Well, the big thing here is the US case against Google uh, for having a monopoly on search. And the big thing of this monopoly, and it, you could argue it's a monopoly. It might not be because they did anything wrong, but they just have such market share, which we saw earlier, right? Pretty high, especially on mobile. Uh, creates a monopoly, and sometimes you go after monopolies, even if they did nothing wrong. It's just, you know, they regulate them or something. So the key thing here is this deal between Google and Apple. And so it, it's something where, as it is right now, Google pays Apple 36% of their revenue, and it was like $18 billion in 2021, and it's probably over $20 billion now a year to do nothing except make it the fault on Safari. That's all they have to do. And, uh, you know, Google said, well, it's not a big deal. You know, people could switch. You know, it's not, it's not that big a deal. And then, of course, the answer to that is, well, why, why are you paying uh, $18 billion if it's not a big deal, right? That's a lot of money to pay for something. And it's definitely a big deal. Um, but to the extent that something happens, uh, and here's a, another story about how they tried to keep Apple out of search. Uh, 
to go and search directly. Uh, the extent that something happens to Google this year, I'm not saying the genre of AI is not important. I think that will have impact. It might impact how long tail searches get clicked on and different things like that. And might change the, the search experience, right? Make it even better. But the biggest impact immediately would be if something happened and uh, Google was no longer in the full search engine on uh, the iPhone for uh, the Safari browser. So if that happens, that could drastically change the uh, uh, the number of the amount of traffic that comes into Google. And again, mobile is much bigger than desktop right now. And for certain types of practice areas, like criminal law, personal injury, now certain areas which are less research oriented, but more they're just looking for an attorney. That could have a significant impact on how you need to optimize yourself. And you might need to spend more time looking at Bing, which most people don't really don't look that much at Bing. Bing's not, you know, the name of Bing doesn't always look for the best quality of content. It's it's not bad, but it's not still not Google in terms of rankings, in terms of what they spend time on. But you'll need to probably need to learn how to spend time on it. And that's a separate way of looking at stuff. Wouldn't worry about it quite yet, but it might be something. And that's sort of the biggest thing that, that could pop up. So we'll see how it goes. These guys are meeting. The DOJ is going to meet with them. I'm sure it'll all be fine. Nothing going on. Uh, but with that, I turn it over to uh, Nina and the questions. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip.